Hey everyone, this is part 6 of I'm a monster created by the government to hunt other monsters. If you want to listen to the first 5 parts, they'll be linked in the top of the description below. Enjoy everyone. Site 12, September 22nd, 1989 Name, said the interviewer, his face steady. Wanting to make sure every single detail he was about to put on record was correct. Dr. Athena L. West, head of the science division and current overseer of Project Emulate, I replied, adjusting my glasses. Please explain the purpose of your experiment and project, he came back. Creating an intelligent artificial being with capabilities far beyond that of a human exoskeleton in order to be weaponized against unlikely creatures and entities. The interviewer looks up, seemingly confused and simultaneously apathetic at my explanation. Miss West. Dr. West, I corrected, keeping my face firm as we locked eyes. Dr. West, do you have a name for this being that you intend to create? Subject 16A. I said quietly, tapping my shoe against the pristine white floor of the room, the sound echoing against the tile below. How far along are you in this project of yours, doctor? Research and planning is complete. Soon, we will begin the manufacturing stage, as well as implementing a failsafe. And that is, the interviewer inquires, licking his lips to punctuate. I stopped, adjusting my chair and shifting my posture. Well, it's actually two. One is highly classified and I will not allow it to be put on this record. I pronounced sternly, my tone making my intentions clear. Well, doctor, he began slowly, not even bothering to ask about the available failsafe as he let out a slow exhale. You have until the end of October to begin and finish the manufacturing stage. Otherwise, funding will be cut and the assets of your project will be seized. I stood up from my chair, slamming my hands down on the table in a furious eruption. That's absurd, I shouted. Do you have any idea how long this will actually take? It's impossible, you numbskull. The interviewer slumps back in his chair seemingly unimpressed by my outburst of rage. I do not make the rule, he began, just before being swiftly cut off by yours truly. No, we need until at least the beginning of December to finish manufacturing. This will all be worth it, I promise you. The interviewer adjusts a wrinkle in his suit, avoiding eye contact with me as he surfs through his mind for a reply. I am not in control of the financial backing for your project, doctor. I'm only telling you what I've been told by my superiors. You can speak with the director of operations as well as Mr. Jones to figure out solutions. The deadline is the deadline and that's that. And with that, the man picked up his briefcase and quietly made his exit from the room, leaving me behind in the silence of the sterilized expanse. I clenched my fist, my blood boiling as I gritted my teeth. I leaned over in my chair, aggressively unzipping my bag and pulling out a large sheet of paper neatly rolled up within it. I set the scroll down, unrolled it, and smiled as I laid eyes upon its contents. A blueprint. A blueprint for Subject 16A. It was beautiful, truly magnificent. I didn't care what the financial officer said. Soon, this would become a reality. And I would prove those who doubted me wrong. I was sure of it. Hey, I'm back everyone. Came John's voice from below. I looked down from the tree from which I was perched. John and Jenny had both arrived back at the spa from going into town. John had discreetly bought a old pickup truck off a farmer not too far from our location out of sheer necessity, as well as a pump shotgun for Jenny. This way, he didn't have to go through the actual process of buying one from a store. 
which is an experience he had a miserable time recalling for the purpose of explaining it to me. John also explained venturing to an ATM to empty out a chunk of funds from his bank account, getting as much physical cash as he could, so there is a much smaller chance of his spending being traced. He went on about having to convince the farmer of letting him use the truck while he went to go get the cash to buy it. Ari and I still venture out into the forest to hunt our food. Just the other night I killed a deer, one that possessed quite the muscular figure along with powerful looking antlers. By appearance alone, I had concluded that he was an alpha male, but despite his best efforts, I had decapitated him with one swift swipe of my claws. Letting his remains fall into my arms before her, I proceeded to carry him on my shoulders back to the spa. Arya and I had ended up sharing the meat from the deer. Me and her had become much closer over the past week, especially since our encounter with Yubel and the black robed people. Jenny had become much more acquainted with the three of us as well, especially John, who she seems most comfortable around. But that didn't mean she hadn't taken a liking to me and Arya as well. My pops used to always take me down to the range, she said, gripping the shotgun John had gotten her. I just never thought I'd be able to own one myself. John smiled, looking intently at Jenny as she posed with her new firearm. Well, after everything that went down last week, everyone here needs to be able to defend themselves, just until everything calms down. It's all about surviving for the time being. John turned over to Arya and I, darting his eyes both up and down the tree. Arya sat at the bottom, staring off into the distance and at the forest ahead. I hear that you're pretty tough yourself, Doc. Jenny smiled. Being a scientist, don't make you no weakling. John's face lit up at the compliment. He turned to look at me his expression becoming more neutral, as if to signal it was time to get to work on something. Both John and Jenny went inside the spa. I crawled down from the top of the tree and gave Arya a glance, attempting to get her attention. Uh, would you like to go inside? I inquired. Arya turned, her snout nearly making contact with my chest. No, I think I'd rather stay out here, she replied softly. I like it outside better. I slightly lowered myself, letting my claws rest against the dirt on the ground. I did not break your promise if that's what you're pondering, I announced, causing Arya to snap her deer skull around in surprise. Do you think the black robes will come back? She asked, with a tone that hinted that she already knew the answer. Definitely. That's why we have to be prepared. You, me, Dr. John, and Jenny, we will have to fight, and sooner than we may anticipate, I replied. We should search for the chapel, Bron, the chapel that Yubel spoke of. I stopped, staring off in the direction of the forest in front of us. Her suggestion was plausible. Back with the agency, John and I were always on the defensive. Perhaps if we attacked first... We could put an end to this conflict before it escalates any further. Maybe we should, but not without planning and preparation, I told her. First, we will need to scout for the chapel. All of us should go, Arya added. Then no one is vulnerable. Also, another intelligent point, one which I acknowledged. You are very smart, Arya, I said, to which she seemed pleased by. I could make out the muscles in her jaws shifting, like she was attempting to smile. Ari and I went inside to inform John and Jenny of our idea. John seemed to approve with a slight bit of hesitation. Jenny, however, objected heavily. No, that's a dummy move, she exclaimed. By no means should we go sticking our noses right where they set up shop. Hey, I know you're scared, John began. After everything you went through with them, you have every right to be. But this, this might be the key to making sure that we get them off our backs before they get the jump on us. Jenny's expression immediately became sour, 
as if John had asked her to antagonize a group of bear cubs with the mother nearby. I really don't think you're getting it, she began. We gotta let them come to us. Then that would only mean they have time to prepare, I interjected. You can trust my judgment here, I assure you. The room fell silent. The four of us all contemplating our thoughts and ideas, figuring out what to say next. Listen, Jenny, John said, breaking the silence. We have guns for each of us, not to mention we have Bron and Arya at our side. If we play our cards right, it should be nearly impossible for us to lose, even if they do have more people. From what Bron said, they don't sound like they have some huge arsenal. They seem to fear and respect us, with the exception of Yubel, I stated. We can take advantage of that and use it to our benefit. Jenny once again dotted her eyes away from the rest of us, shaking her head side to side as she considered the outcome of whatever it is she might say. Fine, but we must get going at night, she finally agreed. John nodded his head, happy that she was now on board. Braun, he called over to me. I want you to lead us. You've got the most experience here out of anyone with this sort of thing. I'll be up in the trees, I replied. Arya will be watching from our rear, preventing anything from sneaking up on us. John and Jenny shall be in the middle. Arya shifted her stance, indicating she desired to add something to the discussion. If we encounter other things, she paused. Ones like me, do not waste your supply. She nodded over at John and Jenny, referring to their bullets. She's right, I chimed in. Arya and I will deal with any cryptids, so as long as they're not in a large gathering. We're not built to see well in the dark like you two, came John. Maybe I can head back into town and get Jenny and I a couple of flashlights. We'll get some duct tape and attach them to our guns. It's not super ideal, but it'll have to do for now. A wise idea, doctor, I responded. I'll be honest when I say I could empathize with Jenny's hesitance. The black-robed people were still a new threat, one that we knew quite little about. And no opponent should ever be underestimated. But unlike with the agency, they weren't nearly as heavily equipped as far as weaponry goes. However... We were still unsure of their numbers, but it was a risk that would be worth it in the end. My main source of second thoughts came from Yubel. I could still remember those eyes of his, the eyes that were just as blue as my skin. The first time that I had encountered Yubel, I hesitated for far too long to kill him, but this time I was going to make sure that it did not play out the same way. I refused to make the same foolish mistake twice. I stated previously that I was okay with Arya killing the black-robed people, due to their extremely depraved and petty nature. Seen as in the agreement of our promise, I had said that if killing a human or a group of humans protected innocence, then it was justified. And Orif said humans were more monster than man. They had already proven themselves to be a great threat to innocent people, as well as making servants out of cryptids a fate far worse than death. In my experience, that qualified them as corrupted beings. Therefore, I wouldn't protest their deaths. I myself, however, didn't plan to kill most of them. Just Yubel. The others, I would simply incapacitate or knock unconscious. Unless the situation had deemed it necessary for me to do otherwise. Tonight, blood was likely going to be shed. But I knew that if it was in the name of saving more lives, then it was what was needed to be done. Arya and I had made a quick journey out into the forest that evening, killing a few smaller animals and feasting on them to make sure that our hunger was in check. We didn't want the urge popping up again in the middle of tonight's dangerous journey. John and Jenny both arrived back after a couple of hours of being in town, getting their flashlights as well as small packages of food and other edible sustenance to keep their strength high throughout the night. The four of us huddled around one of the tables inside the spa. Alright, 
So I think what we'll do is take the truck along one of the dirt roads as far as we can into the forest. John announced. I'm not sure how deep it actually goes, but at least we won't have to be on foot the entire time. Bron and Arya, you two are both more than fast enough to keep up with the speed that's what we'll be going at. It's mainly for Jenny and I's sake. That way, we also wouldn't slow you guys down. I can assist with showing the way, Arya added in. It's true. She had seen how far they had made it when they were retreating to the chapel with Jenny. I validated. I was too occupied with Helena to do so. John smirked proudly, pointing at Arya. Okay then, I guess Arya will be giving us directions. Braun, I still want you in front and up in the trees, keeping an eye out for anything that might be blocking our path or watching us. Arya can be by the driver's side door, signaling me where to go. And Jenny, John said, turning his head. You'll quite literally be riding shotgun, he smiled. Jenny chuckled as she held the barrel of her shotgun in front of her, still working on duct taping the flashlight to it. The next hour, Mamie, Arya, and I had waited for John and Jenny to be fully geared up. It brought back memories of being at the agency, waiting for all the personnel to get ready for a mission. But I pushed those thoughts away. They finished after several more minutes of fiddling with the duct tape. John with his assault rifle and Arya with her pump shotgun. Flashlights equipped and dressed in dark clothing. Alright, listen... I'm going to be serious with all of you for a second. John announced as we all surrounded the pickup truck. This is dangerous. I won't lie when I say that I'm having some second thoughts. But in the event we don't make it out of this with our blood pumping, I just want to say that it's been an extreme pleasure to know the three of you, even if it's only been for a little while. I know, I know, it sounds corny, but I mean it. John then turned his gaze to me taking a few steps closer in my direction as we locked eyes. And Braun, this all started with you. You helped me see the truth of my old job, my old life. You're far from normal or average, but you've been more of a friend to me than any person ever has. We haven't known each other for long, but we've been through more together in the past nine months than most people have in a lifetime. I swear in my life that one day... Humanity will learn to accept you. I'll make sure that they do. I laid down my life for you, Braun, because I know you would do the same for me. My teeth gleamed in the moonlight as I smiled and my eyes pierced through the shadows. My night vision kicking in as the darkness became more potent. You are an admirable man, John. I began. You have helped me learn the ways of your species and what it means to be more than just a mercenary. You were the first human to show me true, unconditional kindness. And for that, I thank you. Jenny smiled, while Arya stared at us blankly. She comprehended the situation, but it had always been difficult to determine her emotional state from just visuals alone. Well, aren't both you just two peas in a pod? She added in last second. John's eyes darted back and forth as he got into the driver's side of the truck. Jenny followed suit into the passenger seat. Arya and I rode in the back of the truck until we got to the dirt road that we were planning to use in order to enter the forest. Going in the direction of where the chapel was supposedly located. We're getting close to the entrance. and Get ready to hop out, guys. John announced waving his hand out the window to me and Arya. The rocks and soil crunched underneath the wheels of the truck. I picked up the smell of blood and rotting flesh, only to find out that it was a dead raccoon that had been laying on the road about a hundred meters in front of us. Soon enough, we arrived at the forest entrance. Arya and I leaped out from the back of the vehicle as it made contact with the beginning of the dirt path. As planned, Arya shifted herself over to the driver's side, running next to the truck as it trudged down the path. I dove over onto the nearest tree on the right side of the road, immediately scaling to the top and beginning to jump my way across each tree. I kept an eye out, making sure there was no one or nothing unblocking the path. I also luckily didn't pick up any scents of cryptids or humans. 
Although a potent smell of pine made its way into my nostrils, despite the fact the forest lacked any pine trees. I kept myself well ahead of the truck, which was only going about 20 miles per hour, which is a speed I can more than quadruple when running on all fours. Jenny kept her eye out the passenger window, keeping her shotgun held steady as she scanned the tree line. My night vision had fully kicked in, so I was able to see a plentiful distance ahead of us. It shouldn't have been much longer before we reached the supposed chapel. We didn't do much talking or speaking back and forth. The truck itself was already making enough noise on the dirt. It would have been foolish to add to it. Arya kept pace with John and Jenny, pointing her snouts in the direction that she wanted all of us to go. With only moments passing by, the same smell of pine from earlier started to intensify. The pure potency of it was ridiculously overwhelming. I could tell that it was also bothering Arya. The way that she shook her head as she kept running made it clear. Jeez now, what is all that about? I don't see a lick of pine in these woods and it smells like a dang retail store during Christmas. Jenny complained, attempting to keep her voice down. A steep incline was not too far ahead. I jumped down from the current tree I was in and sprinted across the ground instead. My claws giving me traction in the dirt as I dashed along the terrain. However, at the end of the incline was a makeshift roadblock, an assortment of two fallen trees, torn up bushes and a multitude of sticks and branches. It was obvious this was meant to keep out any vehicles from entering this particular area. Crap. John cursed as the truck slowed to a stop, just feet before the artificial obstacle. Braun, you mind giving us a hand? I stopped as well rotating over to the road and shifting my way toward the driver's side of the truck. Shooting Arya a glance, the both of us maneuvered over to the blockage. I began pushing one of the fallen trees out of the way and off the path, heaving it off the road and letting it slowly make contact with the ground away from the path. Arya grabbed and tossed a bunch of the bushes and smaller items. Once she had got to the second fallen tree, however, she struggled to lift it off to the side, especially due to the fact that it was considerably larger than the one that I had hoisted up on my own. I finished what I was doing and immediately came to her aid, moving towards the middle of the trunk and placing my claws underneath to begin lifting with her. The weight of the tree was no match for our combined physical strength. We both synchronized and carried the tree several feet from the path turning it horizontally as we set it down, making sure to do so quietly and with calculated movements. Arya turned, those sunken eyes looking directly into mine once again. Thank you, Bron, she said softly. You're welcome. We're a team, I responded, holding out my right hand in the air and spreading my fingers. Arya stood there, slightly confused, wondering what it is I was trying to convey with the movement. It's a high five. Dr. John showed me, I told her. Arya tilted her snout, raising a claw in the air and pressing it against mine, and proceeding to hold it still. The area around us fell silent for a few moments, neither of us saying anything to each other. Just as I was about to inform her that a high five was more of a quick, slappy motion, John's voice broke through the trees in a loud whisper. Braun, Arya. Come on, we gotta get moving. He called out in a rushed sounding tone. Both of us quickly turned and headed back over to the truck as John and Jenny drove forward yet again. Instead of going back up into the trees, I kept myself in the ground, still running on all fours next to the passenger side of the truck, the side in which Jenny was seated. She gave off the expression of being amused and entertained by watching me dash along the ground. Strong and fast, ain't ya? She chuckled. And quite the athlete there, aren't ya? We only drove for several more minutes before the structure I had assumed to be the chapel came into view just up ahead. The building itself wasn't impressive, nor did it stand out much, but it seemed like that was the entire purpose of its rather lackluster exterior design. During some previous missions at the agency, 
I had been sent after beings that resided in religious buildings or places of worship, so I was familiar with the general idea and look of a chapel. This one was made from mainly a simple stone brick, with dust spread all over its surface. A triangular shaped roof crafted from what looked to be a generic oak wood, along with a small white colored clock tower up sitting atop the roof. The lawn, just 10 feet in front, consisted of a mostly deceased garden, nothing but small ferns and the leftover mass of dead plants as its contents. The trees closest to the actual building possessed no leaves, as if winter had just passed and they were in the process of growing back. I sniffed out for anything, nothing new except the pine smell was picked up, which I was starting to become suspicious of thinking that it may be the presence of a cryptid nearby, even though I didn't see one visually. I signaled for John and Jenny to stop the truck about 40 meters away from the chapel. So far, there were no signs of the black-robed people, which confused all four of us, considering they were supposed to be in high numbers. I did consider the possibility of them hiding, or perhaps they had fled after their encounter with Arya and I, I took another look at Jenny, this time being one of suspicion. Arya had brought up the idea that she may potentially be non-trustworthy, but then again, the circumstances of us stumbling upon her made that seem highly unlikely, so for now, I didn't second guess her intentions. But where are they? Arya asked Jenny, standing up tall as she scanned the area. Jenny exited the truck keeping her shotgun held tight as a confused look emerged out of her face, clearly off-put by the current conditions of the situation. Not a dang clue. Maybe they knew we were coming. Probably hauled their butts to wherever else they set up shop at. They may have left some forensic evidence behind, John added. It's still worth checking out. Might even find out what their grand plan is. The four of us began to march towards the structure, John inspecting his rifle and making sure that it was ready to go. Gotta be honest when I say that I've shot lower caliber stuff before, but nothing this high grade, so hopefully I learn quickly if we get into trouble. We could always switch if you wanna, Jenny replied, a tone of light sarcasm hidden beneath the request. And then I heard it. A strange sound coming from below us in every direction. It was forceful. I could feel the vibrations of it at the bottom of my feet. I immediately began to think back to the yellow tentacle creature in the ground, making me act quickly to make sure my three friends did not beat the same fate as the agents did at the time. Move, now, I commanded to the group. But instead of tentacles bursting up from the earth, it was a multiple entities, all spread out around the general vicinity of the chapel and humanoid in their shape. But that's where the similarities ended. They possessed two arms and two legs. Their skin was made up from distorted tree bark and grass, along with stiff pine needles running along the length of their exoskeleton, acting as a sort of defense mechanism. They were completely covered head to toe by them, all standing at a height of around six feet. Their faces were featureless, other than their movements and disturbing the ground. They themselves made no noise or sounds, no hair anywhere on either side of their head or body, despite the pine needles sticking out from their skin, mimicking the appearance of it. They crawled and dug their way out of the soil from all around us. There had to have been well over nine dozen of them emerging from the dirt. I had considered the possibility that there was something the black-robed people had created or used to guard the chapel, and our presence in the area was what had awoken them. Get back! Get back! John demanded. No! I protested as the creatures rose further and further from the soil. Arya and I will lap around the area, drawing some of them away while you two use your firearms in order to eliminate as many as you can. As I finished speaking, one of the entities had finished his ascent from below, and sprinted at Jenny mercilessly, attempting to pounce on her. 
but she had reacted quickly and fired her shotgun in retaliation, blasting the head and torso off of the creature, also causing thick dark green blood to explode everywhere as a result. The creature made no cries or wails as it ran towards Jenny, or even up to the point it was obliterated by a shotgun. None of them made any verbal noises in fact, indicating that they were more than likely incapable of feeling pain, or were just unable to express it. Okay, you two go, now, John erupted, now raising his rifle and beginning to fire into a small crowd of the creatures. He was taken aback by the recoil but did his best to keep his feet planted firmly while operating the weapon. Luckily, they weren't very durable nor did they appear intelligent. They more or less seemed to be a part of a hive mind, but they were still fast, aggressive, and ruthless, and not to be underestimated, especially when in plentiful groups like this. Both John and Jenny stood back to back as they fired their weapons, the sound of bullets and slugs tearing through the creatures as they ran towards the both of them. Their numbers only seemed to multiply as time went on, and soon there would be too many for just those two to handle even with their firearms. Ari and I sprinted off in opposite directions, bringing around 30 of the entities each with us. Although they were no match for our speed, they didn't give up and mercilessly pursued us nonetheless. I made sure to circle around the area, keeping them in a sort of train-like formation as they grouped up closer and closer together. I readied myself as it came time to start eliminating as many of them as I could in order to thin out their numbers. I picked up two of them, one in each claw and slammed them together so hard that their heads had been obliterated by the forest. The others viciously jumped onto my mass and attempted to dogpile me, to which I reacted to throwing as many off as I could. One in particular had wrapped himself around my left shoulder. I quickly pulled him off, threw him to the ground, and stomped his head in with my right foot. The dark green blood coating my toes and heel as a result. After that, I dropped down and ran forward a little more, just enough to give myself a window to kill a few more. I could still hear the sounds of both John and Jenny's weapons being fired, signaling they were still busy with the ones converging on them. However, I hatched an idea while surrounded by some of the nearby trees. I turned back to the creatures. They continued to stumble and trip as they ran towards me, which is exactly what I wanted. I stood right by the largest tree near me and simply waited, making sure to time it just right. The creatures, now only about 50 feet away, seemingly sped up in their attempt to get after me. I turned and began to slash my claws through the trunk of the tree. Multiple times I went back and forth with both my left and right. The tree now slowly began to tap. Only a few seconds sooner and it would have fallen on its own. I rotated my head back one last time. The monsters in which I had dubbed the Pine Runners were now just about in range, right where I needed them to be, and grouping closer together as well, not single file line clothes but still close enough for my plan to work. I dashed my way around the tree, the opposite side of where the creatures were coming from. I placed both hands on the trunk, heaving it forward and pushing, the weight at the top propelling the momentum of the rest of the trunk below as it swiftly descended towards the ground. The pine runners didn't even look up or notice the tree as it fell down and violently crushed the majority of them evidently too focused on their objective to care or notice. There were still four of my particular group of pine runners left, the ones who had gotten lucky enough to not have been flattened by the tree. I leaped onto the fallen tree trunk and sprinted across it as I focused on one of the creatures to my right. I lipped off and quickly grabbed him, following it up by throwing him to my right. He collided with a sizable branch on the collapsed tree being impaled right through the center of his torso, along with smaller branches piercing his arms and legs as well. The other three lunged their way onto me, one of them latching himself onto my back, and to which I countered by reaching over and burying my claws through the back of his head, causing him to go limp and slump off. 
The remaining pair jumped out of my chest and torso area. I reacted without hesitation and grabbed one by the leg, slinging him through the air and slamming him hard enough onto the ground to destroy his head and upper chest. The final pine runner violently kicked and thrashed as it tried to stay clenched around me. I pulled him off, holding him by each arm with one of my own. I then proceeded to tear off his right arm. He seemed completely unbothered by this and continued his attack. I took the now separated limb and swung it downward in a throwing like motion, bashing him at the top of his head and causing the limb to sink past what looked to be his chin and into the base of his neck. He fell to the ground motionless, that same moss colored blood seeping its way into the dirt below. There's too many. I heard John desperately shout from where he and Jenny were both still defending themselves. Without hesitation, I immediately dropped down and sprinted across the area. John and Jenny were now attempting to fight the creatures in melee form, confirming that they had run out of ammo. I also didn't spot the flashlights on their guns anymore, meaning that they had taken them off in order to convert them into more useful blunt weapons. Jenny ferociously slammed the butt of her firearm into one of the creature's heads, causing some of its blood to explode on her face. Take that, you walking rosebush, she taunted, trying to keep her hopes high. John performed a similar move, reaching forward and jamming the barrel of his rifle into the creature's forehead as he groaned. Get the heck away from me, he snarled unforgivingly. The remaining 40 or so creatures began to surround John and Jenny, and without their guns, they wouldn't stand a chance against such a high number of them. I ran forward. Arya was coming as well, establishing that she had finished dealing with her batch of the Pine Runners as well. Two of the beings leaped out of John, causing him to stumble and fall backward. He punched and kicked to fight them off as they began to overwhelm him. Jenny hit one of them in the back of the head with her shotgun, but was immediately taken to the ground by a few more of the creatures, beginning to scream and kick as they tightened their grip around her. No, no, no! She bellowed, terrified and desperate to get out of the lethal predicament. Arya and I quickly got to work, grabbing and throwing the entities off both John and Jenny. Arya even tossed one up in the air and proceeded to slice him clean in half with her claws. This time, I was the one that demanded that all four of us huddle in a circle as the remaining pine runners lunged and sped towards us. We all began to work as one. John and Jenny bashing the creatures with their weapons, and Arya and I slashing and slicing them to pieces with our claws, and ripping them apart with our strength. At one point, I even witnessed Arya bite the head off one unfortunate pine runner, and spit the remains of it out. One of the creatures in particular jumped up to around my chest. I grabbed him by both the leg and opposite shoulder, applying force and tearing him completely in half. Jenny swung her shotgun upwards and nearly knocked one of the creature's heads clean off. John tackled one to the ground, getting on top of him and driving the barrel of his rifle into the creature's head yet again. Arya tossed an additional pine runner into the air and slashed him clean up the middle, along with tearing the heads off another two of them. Soon, their numbers began to dwindle. We were winning. It wouldn't be long before we had put an end to the small army. With less than a dozen left, I continued to slice and tear my way through the creatures. Arya did as well. John and Jenny huffed and groaned as they began to grow fatigued, exerting themselves to their breaking points in order to stay alive and in the fight. I barreled into the small group that remained, slashing and throwing the creatures to the side, as well as picking them up and bashing them into each other as makeshift melee weapons finishing off the remaining pine runners. The four of us took a moment of silence as we looked around, making sure that we had done away with every last one of the attackers. Piece of cake, John quipped, right before coughing up a small patch of blood onto the grass of one of the corpses below. My lord, are you alright? Jenny kneeled down, her shirt torn as a few strips of her blood stained the material. I marched over to John, holding out a claw and nodding for him to grab it. Thanks, Bron, 
he said gratefully. Never thought I'd get to kick some butt with you like that. We were successful together, I replied. All of us. Jenny smiled as I helped John to his feet. Arya used a claw to wipe some of the remaining blood from the Pine Runners off her snout. I was honestly pretty terrified for a second there. John followed up. I genuinely thought Jenny and I were goners once they had started dogpiling on us. I tried to get to the truck and maybe run some of them over, but they just wouldn't let up. If one of us perishes, then we all do. I countered. I still don't think we got the right idea being out here, but might as well click our heels and keep moving. We went through all that trouble. John responded to her proposal with an agreeing chuckle, attempting to break the tension. Oh yeah, just a little trouble. No different than forgetting something at the grocery store. Arya and I simply stared while Jenny laughed. John, seemingly pleased with that outcome. We should enter the chapel now, I said, motioning for the other three to follow. Arya moved in front and stood next to my side, the two of us leading the others once again as we marched forward. You fight well, I complimented, and so far you've kept your promise. I can honestly say I've grown to admire you very much. Arya stumbled in her step for a second as if she had intended for me to stop as well, but kept going when she saw that I wasn't going to. Uh, you fight really great too. I saw you with the tree. Very smart. She complimented in return. Once we had all made it to the front door of the chapel, we realized that all the chaos of everything that went down had distracted us from the fact that the main handles of the door were wrapped in chains. I turned, bringing my claws out and slicing the chains with one quick motion, to which Arya assisted by pulling them off the door. Before we actually opened the door, however, I told the other three to stand back. In the event the black-robed people were either waiting to ambush us, or they had another mindless cryptid inside being used as a guard. Grabbing both sides of the door, I pulled back and tore it right off its hinges, tossing it over John and Jenny's heads. I readied myself for an attack immediately, drying my claws and shifting my posture. Nothing came instead. The chapel was mostly vacant. Nothing but seats and torn apart books that were spread out amongst the interior. This didn't seem like a place anyone had been in recently, which begged the question of whether or not the black-robed people were lying. We are safe to enter, I told everyone being the first one to step inside as the group followed. All sorts of spiderwebs and dust had found their home inside, speaking of which, one spider in particular was around the size of my hand, seemingly a cryptid in and of itself. A black, hairy, and unsettling eight-legged beast. He scurried out the door, causing Jenny to frantically scream as it brushed past her foot. Oh, come on now. Y'all can't tell me something that big is just normal. She complained. After everything that just went down, it's honestly welcome at this point. John countered. We continued deeper into the chapel towards the altar, on top of which sat an open book. This one, much more intact than the others, and looking to be well over a thousand pages in length. As I've said previously, in the past, I've been sent to deal with sinister cryptids relating to religious origins, possessions of people such as churchgoers, priests, nuns, and reverends. While I was far from knowledgeable on the details of it, I was at least somewhat familiar with the basic ideas and structure. This chapel, however, didn't appear Christian in any way. There was not a single cross to be found. Instead, there were sculptures lining the walls of what looked to be a horrifically designed girl with monstrous features. They weren't well crafted, but the concept they attempted to convey was clear. She had the general body of a young human girl, but on these spots of her build where she should have possessed hands and feet were the heads of what looked to be other women, some older and some younger. In total, she had possessed five heads. Only one had their eyes open, the one atop her neck, which was the most normal head of the five. Although, I use that term in the context of what's normal for humans. 
The other four heads at the ends of her arms and legs were heavily burnt and charred, as if they had been freshly retracted from a fire, which immediately raised a concern for me, considering these circumstances in which we had found Jenny in. None of us were able to get any words out for the time being. We all simply stood there, staring down the main statue as it almost stared back at us. An idea clicked in my head, as I remembered what Yubel said to the other black-robed people as Arya and I came to rescue Jenny. We can't let him destroy what we are trying to create. Eventually, Jenny had broken the unforgiving silence. I could sense that she was in discomfort, and it wasn't physical, not in the slightest. I never read a thing about this in the Bible, she said, intrigued yet repulsed by the sculpture. Is this what they worship? John chimed in. They all gazed at me, nothing but morbid curiosity, and sheer intrigue in their expressions. I darted my eyes over to the open book on the lectern. All sorts of strange word combinations and numberings covered the two visible pages. No, I said, responding to John. It's what they're trying to create.